بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على السيد المرسلين سيدنا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه وسلم تسليما كثيرا ربنا لك الحمد كما ينبغي لجلال وجهك ولعظيم سلطانك سبحانك لا نحسي ثناء عليك أنت كما ثنيت على نفسك اللهم صل وسلم وبارك على سيدنا وحبيبنا وقرة أعيننا محمد وآله وصحبه وسلم تسليما كثيرا السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته This is Imam Zayd Shaq and we're here to continue our exploration of the poetry in Ibn, uh, Ibn Rajab al-Hamdi's La Ta'af al-Ma'arif Rahimahullah wa nafa'anullahu bihi wa bikum ajma'in and so we've, uh, we're at the beginning of a new section which we mentioned last week. This section opens with the hadith of Ibn Abbas in radiallahu anhuma, where he relates, كان رسول عن Ibn Abbas in radiallahu anhuma, قال كان رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم أجود الناس وأجود ما يكون في رمضان هنا يلقاه جبريل فيدرسه القرآن و و وكان جبريل يلقاه كل في كل ليلة من رمضان فيدرسه القرآن ولا رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم هنا يلقاه جبريل أجود في الخير من الريح المرسلة. So this hadith related by Ibn Abbas, may Allah be pleased with him and his father. He says, بسم الله الرحيم. Alhamdulillah. <coughs> That the Messenger of Allah, the peace and blessing of Allah be upon him, was the most generous of all people in the time he was especially generous was in Ramadan when the angel Gabriel would come to him and review the Quran with him. And the angel Gabriel would come to who used to come to him every night during Ramadan and review the Quran with him. And the Messenger of Allah, when Gabriel came to him in Ramadan to review the Quran, was more generous and good than the fecundating winds, than the freely blowing wind that indiscriminately uh, spreads the seeds. The good of the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was indiscriminate. It touched everyone in some ways. It touched the disbelievers. Our earlier prophets, when their people rebelled against them, Allah destroyed them. Those who rebelled against the uh, Rasulullah, those who fought against Rasulullah, such as Abu, Abu Sufyan, Khalid bin al-Walid, uh, etc. The, the Allah Taala gave the the people of Taif, who stoned and ridiculed the Messenger of Allah. Allah Taala gave them spite, or re, re, gave them uh, respite until they were able. They had the opportunity to come into Islam and become Muslim. And the Prime Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam As opposed to inviting the wrath of Allah upon them He would pray for them But in any case His good was for everyone Even his enemies Were affected in some ways by his good Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam And Ramadan encourages us to imitate that way Imam Shafi'i Rahimahullah he said, people should strive to be exceptionally generous in Ramadan following the way of the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And we mentioned last week, or I believe we mentioned or perhaps in another sitting, uh, that one of the reasons that the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was so generous in Ramadan was that as he reviewed the Quran with the angel Gabriel, he would come across the verses relating to spending. Such as at the very beginning of Surah Baqarah, وَمِمَّا and they spin from what we bestowed upon them. they spin their wealth despite their love of it. And so spin before a day comes upon you, and to summarize, you won't have an opportunity to spend. So Brothers and sisters, this is the way of Rasulullah. So he opens this chapter, and then he has several verses of poetry that reinforce that meaning. One of them is a very beautiful uh, couplet that said after a poet was pra uh, praised the generosity of a king. 
So this poet wrote some verses to praise the generosity of the king. So many uh, of the kings and princes, they had the court poet. So it would be like the state poet and poet laureate in our days, or the city's poet laureate. In any case, he praised the king, and the king gave him a, a prize, a gift of money. And he did it for the money. So he knew uh, it's like you go to someone's house, you know you're going to get fed. So you can't get your dinner together, you're running late, and you just happen to visit these most generous folks. You know you're going to get fed. So he knew if he lavished poetic praise upon this particular king, he was going to get some money. And so he, he recited the poetry, and then the king gave him some money, and then he went and he gave it all away in charity. Then he wrote the following couple couplet. He says, so he, he said that I, I touched, I, I placed my hand in his hand, seeking some seeking wealth. And I didn't realize that the good of his hand was contagious. I didn't realize the good of his hand was contagious. And, and so was the upshot of this, brothers and sisters. The good of the Messenger of Allah, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, ajwad and nasi, the most generous of all people, is contagious. And it spreads to us uh, as, as his followers. So we are an ummah of, of charity. We are an ummah of spending. We are an ummah of, of uh, lending financial and material support to others. This is our way. Uh, Allahumma salli ala Sayyidina Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam tasliman kathira. Uh, one of the Sufis said, will translate what he said in the interest of time. He said that the most despicable of all things is a stingy Sufi. Is a, is a stingy Sufi. And, and so charity is the way of the Ummah of Muhammad. <clears throat> Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So he did he said, I didn't realize that charity was from his hand was contagious. So he went to get some money for his personal benefit. And when he took it from the hand of the king, his the king's generosity was contagious. He went out and gave it all away. May Allah give us tawfiq and taysir. Uh, the next uh three or four lines or so. Uh, were attributed to one of the great poets by the name of uh, Abi Tamam. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. He praised one of the rulers of his day, and Ibn Rajab, when he mentions these verses in Lataf and Ma'arif, he says that these verses are only fitting for the Messenger of Allah, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. In other words, the praise of generosity is only fitting for Ejwadun Nas, Ejwadun Nas, is only fitting for the most generous of all people, the Messenger of Allah, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Alhamdulillah. So uh, the poet he said, Ta'awwad al-basta al-kaffi hatta lawannahu thanaha liqabtin nam tujibhu anamilu tarahu idha ma jittahu mutahallilan ka'annaka tu'atihi alladhi anta sa'ilu so he says that uh, he became so accustomed to spending that if he were to order his fingers to curl up to with, withhold something, they wouldn't obey him. Like, Curl up, hold back. No, I can't do it. I can't do it. His fingers wouldn't obey him. You say you you see him, Tarahu Ida Majitta You see him, his face is glowing when you come to ask something from him, as if you're going to give him what you're asking from him. So some of us we see someone coming, we get anxious. Oh, here they come again. They're gonna ask me for something. He's the opposite. Oh, someone's going to ask. Yes, Allah. Allah, likewise, a good day today. Someone's coming to ask me for something. 
تراه إذا ما جدته متهللا كأنك تعطيه الذي أنت سائل He's an ocean from any direction you approach him. His depths are generosity and his shores are goodness. Allahu Akbar. This is beautiful poetry. لا إله إلا الله هو البحر من أي النواحي أتيته فلجته معروف والجود ساحل. So he's in his depths. Are, he's an ocean whose depths are generosity and whose shores are goodness. ولو لم يكن في في ولو يم ولو لم يكن في كفه غير روحي if he had nothing in the palm of his hand except his very soul. لجاد بها فليتق الله السائل. He would give that away. So let one asking any of anything of him be mindful of Allah. It's like, yeah, why did you ask him for your coat? That's a nice coat. Oh, you like it? Bismillah. So you know he gives anything away. Why did you? Let the one asking anything of the fear of Allah. Yeah, let me have your house. Okay, Here, here's the keys. Bismillah. Tfaddam. So may Allah give us a generous heart. May Allah Ta'ala bless us with generous, kind hearts that aren't afraid to give. When the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam on the day of Hunayn, Yawmi Hunayn, there was a man from the uh, recently converted people, his name was Al-Aqara, Al-Aqara bin Habis. And the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he gave him a live, a valley full of livestock, full of goats and sheep and cattle, a valley full. And what did he do? He returned to his people. So as it's related, فَرَجَعَ إِلَىٰ قَوْمِهِ فَقَالَ يَا قَوْمْ أَسْلِمُوا فَإِنَّ مُحَمَّدًا يُعْطِي عَطَاءَ مَنْ لَا يُخْشَ الْفَاقَةِ He returned to his people and he said, Oh people become Muslim. يَا قَوْمْ يَا قَوْمِ أَسْلِمُوا Become Muslim. Because Muhammad gives like a man who doesn't fear poverty. So his being ajwad and nasi is a function of his being ashja'in nas. Ashja'in nas. So one of the great virtues, uh, charity is not one of them, four great ones, wisdom, hikmah, justice, al-adl, restraint, al-iffa, and courage, shaja'a. Those are the four great ones. Yeah, those are in the Aristotelian tradition and they've been adopted into the Muslim tradition and Imam Ghazali mentions them in the Ihya. So where is, where is char charity is a function of courage? Because, uh, and these two qualities, charity and courage, are combined in this hadith of Al-Aqra bin Habis. فَرَجَعَ إِلَىٰ قَوْمِهِ He will return to his people وقال, and he said, Ya Qawm, O my people, Aslimu, become Muslim. Fa inna Muhammadan, for very Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Yu'ati, he gives, Ata'a, the giving, men of one, Yaqsha al faqa La Yaqsha al faqa one who doesn't fear poverty. So his charity and his, his courage are coupled together. So we should live our lives as people who don't fear poverty. And reason, within reason, we don't have a field, so we give everything and now we have crops in the field, we can go and eat chickens in the backyard. Most of us, that's not our situation. So we shouldn't uh, put ourselves in any danger of starvation or depriving our families, but we should not be constrained by fear. We should not be constrained by fear. If I give this, oh, What's going to happen? What if the economy tanks again, etc.? We should not be constrained by fear, brothers and sisters. Allahumma salli wa rasulillah. So uh, the next uh, couplet is introduced by uh, Ibn Rajab. There's a passage, we read the passage where he's longing, longing for, for those believers of the past. And that was in his day. So what about our day? 
who who reflected those those values and who spent freely, not fearing poverty, trusting in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. She's longing for them. So he says, Rahimullah, Salamullahi ala tilka al arwahi, Rahmatullah ala tilka al ashbahi, Lam yabqa minhum illa akhbarun wa atharun. Kam bayna man yamnu al haq al wajiba alayhi wa bayna ahl al ithari. Man, Allah says, prose was very poetic. So he says that uh, the peace of Allah upon those spirits. So his bidding farewell, farewell to those spirits, they're gone. Salamullah ala tilka al arwahi. And then he says, wa rahmatullah ala tilka al ashbahi. And may the mercy of Allah be upon the bodies that contain those spirits. So you have the arwah and the ashbah, the forms, the spirit and the forms. So the physical forms that contain those spirits that is passed on. So, rahimahumullah, rahmatullah, ala tilka al-ashbahi. And uh, Allahum sar rasulillah. So he says, and, and there remains nothing of them except news and information about how they wore. So akhbar. And some traces of what they did in the world. So we go and we travel in the Muslim world. We see these monuments that are testimonies to the, the love of the people for Allah, the, the Jam al Amawi, al Hamra, all of these beautiful al, al Masjid al Aqsa, Qubbatul Sakhra, the Dome of the Rock, all of these testimonies to the Muslims' love for Allah. We see the great school, the Qarawiyin, Qayrawan, Mustan Syria. Al Azhar, and and we 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 have to understand, brothers and sisters, these schools were massive operations, built and maintained by charity. Fatima al Fihriya, Fatima bint Muhammad al Fihri, she spent her entire inheritance, the wealth she inherited from her father, she spent to build Qarawiyin, and by the barakah. She fasted the entire time it was being built. She only used materials from the land that she had purchased with her inheritance. She know that everything that went into building that institution was based on halal. There was no haram. And now to this day, people are studying knowledge. People are praying in Karawiyin. La illallah. This is the kind of vision we have to have, brothers and sisters. And we're not, we're trying to build Zaytuna, Zaytuna College. We're trying to build something that's going to last, outlast us. We're trying to establish a, 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 an endowment, such as the endowment established by Fatima bint Muhammad al Fihri or Fatima al Fihriya. So that those who come after us can point to what we did. And it's nothing in comparison to what they did. But it's something that they can, can point to. Let me focus my camera one second. I went out of focus. It's a simple operation. I could just get something to use. Sorry about that. Apologies. In any case, so it, it's a simple upper, it's, it's simple as compared to what they did, but something that those who come after us can point to. And to say that that those Muslims, all of you, those who donate to support, that they had something of the spirit that those poets and those scholars were talking about. And it was enough to establish this institution. La illallah, Allah is Rahim, Allah is merciful brothers and sisters. So it, he says that so there's nothing remains of them except the news of how they wore and what they did. 
and the evidences of that. And we say, you see these monuments, you see these institutions, those are the athar that point to them and indicate who they were and what they did. So one of the poets said, he mentions after that, لا تعرضن لذكرنا في ذكرهم ليس صحيح إذا مشى كالمقعد that don't allow our remembrance to turn to lead you to neglect their remembrance. Though the sound one who walks is not the one who is sitting. And, and so sometimes we don't take the opportunity to fully appreciate what those who came before us have done because we're so obsessed about those of lesser stature. Let us never forget the Salaf of this Ummah. Let us never forget the, the great legal minds who established the foundations of the legal systems that gave a, 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 a anchorage to our civilization. Let us never forget the great spiritual sages who really showed us what it means to be human what it means to, to look beyond the interest and the well-being of this physical body and to look at, at so this ash, these ashbah, to use the, the phraseology we just introduced, and to look at the arwah, to look at the spirits inhabiting these physical bodies because that's what makes us human. When that spirit is re withdrawn, then our reality is revealed. What is our reality? Without the spirit, what is our physical reality? The atheists, they'll say, oh, we're just molecules. Adam, take that spirit away. And we're just a bag of pus and feces and blood and urine. That's it. mucus. That's, that's, and then what does it smell like? Why didn't it smell like that when the spirit was inhabiting the body? And so what is it that animates us? What is it? that ignites our intellect and what do we become physically when that's withdrawn? We become one of the most putrid things imaginable. And we pray you, not, you never have to smell a decaying corpse. But that's who we are once that spirit is withdrawn. So what is it that humanizes us? It's the spirit, it's the ruh that humanizes us. So he says, don't, don't allow our remembrance to distract you from their remembrance. La ilaha illallah. Allah. Then he, this section, so we mentioned generosity and al-jood wa tilawatul Qur'an and reciting the Qur'an. So one of the poets, he says, man al Qur'an bi wa'adihi wa wa'idihi مقل العيون بليلها لا تهجعوا فهموا من الملك العظيم كلامه فهما تذل له الرقاب وتخضع. So he said the Quran with its promises and its threats prevents the eye, prevents the pupils of the eyes from sleeping at night, and they understand during those precious special hours in the still of the night when it's quiet and one is standing up and communing with one's Lord. They understand during those times from the great mighty king, his speech and understanding that causes their necks to bow in humility and obedience. So that is, brothers and sisters, it is humbling it is humbling. The truth of this deen is humbling. The truth of our Lord conveyed through his speech in the Quran is humbling. That we're, just think about it, during this month of Ramadan, the month of the Quran, that we are communing directly with our Lord through the worlds that the creator of the heavens and the earth, the one who has existed before his order to bring it all into existence was issued, has sent a timeless message embodied 
embodying his timeless speech to us and we're reading it today. We're reading it, we're listening to it at nights in taraweeh. We're reading it during the daytime as we try to read our juz, or hizb, or however much we read from the Quran. That we are in direct communication with the Lord of the worlds. That's humbling, brothers and sisters, and that he chose us. He didn't choose everyone. Inna Ibrahim kan ummatan qanitan lillah hanifan lam yaku min al-mushrikeen shakiran li an'umi ishtabahu wa hadahu ila sirat al-mustaqeem Inna Ibrahim kan ummatan qanitan lillah hanifan wa lam yaku min al-mushrikeen Ibrahim was a nation unto himself, ummatan, khanitan lillah, an obedient nation. He was naturally inclined towards the worship of the one true God, halifan, wa lam yaku min al-mushrikeen. He was not amongst the idolaters, shakiran li al-umi. He was deeply obedient to his Lord. Or thankful, rather, appreciative. Ishtabahu, his Lord, chose him. He was chosen. He was chosen. And like Ibrahim, another verse where Ibrahim is mentioned, Millata abikum Ibrahim, that verse starts out mentioning that we too have been chosen. Wajahidu fillahi haqqa jihadi huwa ishtabakum. Strive in the way of Allah as should rightfully be the case. Haqqa jihadi. He has chosen you. Brothers and sisters, sometimes as Muslims we boast there are 2 billion Muslims, 1.8 billion Muslims. Takbir Allahu Akbar. And that's wonderful to know there's that many Muslims on the face of the earth. But guess what? There are nine billion people. There are nine billion people. So even though Islam might be one of the largest religions, still the Muslims in relation to those people who aren't Muslim are a relatively small minority. Two billion out of nine billion. Which means what? It means everyone hasn't been chosen for this great, great honor. Everyone has not been chosen for this great, great honor, but you've been chosen, brothers and sisters. You have been chosen, my brothers and my sisters, for this great, great, great honor. Ishtabakum. And Allah has made no difficulty for us in the religion. Ibrahim. This is the way of your forefather, Abraham. So this is an honor. May Allah give us tawfiq and may Allah bless us to really appreciate this honor. And one way we appreciate it is staying in touch with our Lord. Staying in touch with the Quran. Staying in touch with the Quran. Losing sleep because of the Quran. Losing sleep because of it, as the poet mentioned and being humbled by it. It's humbling, right? Out of all of those nine billion people, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has chosen us. <clears throat> the majority haven't been chosen. Which the bakum? He's chosen you. May Allah give us tawfiq and tayseer and kabul. La illallah. But when we read the Quran, it's incumbent upon us to act upon it, to act upon its guidance. It's not, it's not entertainment. We don't read the Quran to be entertained. We read the Quran to be strengthened. We read the Quran to be inspired. We read the Quran to be guided. We read the Quran to be helped and assisted. That's why we read the Quran, brothers and sisters. And if we read it and we don't act upon it, we don't act upon its guidance, 
We're not reflective of its light. We're not following its injunctions. We're not avoiding those things it enjoins upon us to avoid. And we're not implementing those things it commands us to implement. Then the Quran will be a witness and a proof against us yawm al qiyamah and not for us. On the day of resurrection, the Quran will be a witness against us and not for us. Never forget that, brothers and sisters. Never, ever, ever forget that. So one of the poets, he said, شُفَعَاؤُهُ خُسَمَاؤُهُ وَصُورُ فِي يَوْمِ فِي يَوْمِ الْقِيَامَةِ يُنْفَخُ He said, woe to one whose intercessors, those who should be intercessing on his or her behalf, are the ones arguing against them. So the one who should be your defense lawyer becomes the prosecutor who's prosecuting you. While all the while the horn, the trumpet, the great horn is being blown on the day of resurrection. La ilaha illallah. May Allah Ta'ala give us tawfiq and taysir and kabul in, in our affair. And bless us to be mindful and respectful and to appreciate the blessing of the Quran. La taqul. Alif lam mim harf. Don't say alif lam mim is a single letter. Walakin alifun harf. Walamun harf. Wa mimun mimun harf. Wal hasanatu bi ashriyam thaliha. Rather say alif is an individual letter. And lam is an individual letter. And mim is an individual letter. And good deeds are multiplied ten times over. And in Ramadan, they multiply 700 times over. Allah. May Allah bless all of us. Allah. So, act on the Quran. Act on the Quran. Stay close to the Quran. It's related in Ramadan that both Imam Abu Hanifa and Imam Shafi did 60 khatims. That's two a day. Read the entirety of the Quran twice a day, every day in Ramadan. That was, man, that was the, the himmah. Some people, oh, that's impossible. Anyone who is familiar with the Quran knows that's extremely doable, but it takes focus and it takes himmah. It takes a, a strong, strong, strong spiritual drive. May Allah give us something of what those great imams, may Allah's mercy be upon them, what they possessed. So we can make it through once during Ramadan or twice. May Allah give us something of what they possessed. Some people, some person might ask that you shouldn't read the Quran in less than 10 days under normal circumstances. But... There, uh, there are exceptions, and two of those sep uh, exceptions are sharf al-zaman or sharf al-makan, the, the virtue of the place. So if you're in Mecca and your deeds are multiplied 100 th times over your prayer, and your righteous deed and your Quran and your arad and afkar, what do you do? You take advantage. If you have an opportunity to do a khatam in one day, you do it. You take advantage for it to put to gain garner all of that hasanat, all of that good into your account. And Ramadan, Ramadan, it's a special time. The deeds are multiplied. So again, if you can read the Quran every two or three days during this month, then do so. But think, think of the edge. Every every letter is seven hundred during this time. Alif. Not alif lam mim. Alif alone is a single letter. Multiply seven hundred times over. How many letters in the Quran? So what if you did three or four khatims? What if you were a Shafi or an Abu Hanifa? How much good would you gain, brothers and sisters? These are the secrets that led them to change the world. 
the, the spiritual strength, it wasn't the strength of their armies. It was the strength of their spirits and their souls that moved mountains. They couldn't physically move mountains, but spiritually they could crush mountains. And that strength of spirit came from their attachment to the Quran, came to, to their humility before their Lord. That's where it came from. That's the key that unlocks the secret to the power that they possess. May Allah give us a fraction of it, as we said. La ilaha illallah. So the, the Quran is a, a great, 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 great means for us to connect. We'll, we'll conclude this uh, concluding as a, a fairly lengthy poem to conclude this section before being beginning a section on the middle days of Ramadan. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. So now we're past the beginning. We're moving up on the second week, completing the second week and entering into the third. So now we're in it, as they say. And once you get past halfway, what does that mean? It means that Ramadan is beginning its exit. And so, brothers and sisters, double down in exhorting yourself. Double down in your prayers. Double down in your Quran. Double down, brothers and sisters. Now is the opportunity. So he concludes by saying, quoting a poet who said, Ya nafsu faza salihuna bituqa wa absur haqqa wa qalbi he said, oh, my soul, ya nafsu, the righteous people have gained the victory of God consciousness and they see the truth, but my heart is blind. My heart is blind. Ya husnahum wal qad jannahum Oh, how beautiful they are. And the night has concealed them. But their light has outshone even the light of the stars. So they're standing for prayer during the, court and during, during the nights of Ramadan. Man qama Ramadan. Iman and wahtisab and ghufira lahu ma taqaddam min dhambi. Whoever spends... A, a significant portion of the nights of Ramadan in worship and prayer, standing in prayer, all of their prior sins will be forgiven. La ilaha illallah. La ilaha illallah. And most scholars say those are from their lesser sins. So their lights outshine even the lights of the stars. تَرَنَّمُوا بِالذِّكْرِ فِي لَيْلِهِمْ فَعِيشِهُمْ قَدْ طَابَ بِالتَّرَنُّمِ Said so they're, they're singing the remembrance of their Lord during their nights and their life, their, their living has become sweet with chanting and singing the Qur'an, they're chanting the Qur'an at night. And this is we have to be a people of Qur'an, brothers and sisters. We have to be a people of Qur'an. And that's not some of us, that's most of us. Certainly not all of us, but that's most of us. <clears throat> and when we are a people of, a, of the Qur'an, what are the consequences? An Umar radiallahu anhu, qal, qala Rasulullahi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, Omar, may Allah be pleased with him. He relates that the Messenger of Allah, peace and blessings of Allah be upon him, said, Verily Allah elevates by means of this book, Al Quran, some people, and by it he debases others. Those who attach themselves to the Quran. Those who are reciting the Qur'an as a people, this is their general quality, one of their general qualities. Those who are implementing the rulings of the Qur'an, those whose worldview 
and how they see existence and how they see their place in existence is shaped by the Quran. Those are the people elevated in Allah yarfa'u bihad al kitab aqwama. And those who do the opposite, they are the ones who are debased. Kulubuhum bid dhikri kat tafarraqat. Dumu'uhum kalu'lu'in muntadami. He said that, that their hearts have become emptied of everything other than Allah through the remembrance of Allah. And their tears are like pearls strung on a necklace. So when they read the Qur'an and the tears are flowing from their eyes, those tears are like a necklace of pearls. Allah give us tawfiq. Asharuhum bihim lahum qad ashraqat wa qila'ul kufrani khayrul qisami That their, their late nights for them, because of them, for them have become illuminated. And the cloaks of forgiveness draped upon them are the best thing to be distributed amongst them. Oh, so beware that you do not wake up. So beware of not waking up. And be a benefit to me before my foot slips, before I fall into error or sin. And so the soul, this will we take care of our soul so that our soul will take care of us. And if we don't take care of our soul, the most vicious of your enemies when you don't take care of it and you don't train it and you don't refine it is that soul that resides between your two flanks. Why? Because it knows us better than anyone. With the exception of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Therefore, it can trip us up in ways nothing else can. And then finally, مَضَى الزَّمَانُ فِي تَوَانٍ وَهَوَى فَاسْتَدْرِكِي مَا قَدْ بَقِيَ وَغْتَنِمِي so he says that time has passed by filled with laxity, procrastination, and laziness, and following whims, vanities and whims. Make up for what is what you have lost with what remains and take uh, uh, and gain benefit. So take the booty, economy. Uh, uh, just gain and benefit from the time remaining. That's two things. We say this in conclusion, brothers and sisters. The time remaining of Ramadan, one. Number two, the time remaining from our lives. Because tomorrow is promised to no one. May Allah give you all tawfiq and taysir. So any questions or comments, ahlan wa sahlan, wa marhaban, ahlan wa sahlan. Uh, Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. So, a viewer from last week asked for clarification should we not ask Allah for ease and to relieve our hardships? Now, um, most definitely, we should ask for ease, but we should prepare for hardship. So, we should ask for ease, but we should prepare for hardship. What we mentioned last week, we shouldn't ask for hardship. Don't ask to meet any enemy. Don't ask for a fight. Don't ask for trouble. But if you are put in a difficult situation, then be patient. Safa from Nevada. Ahnan bi Safa from Nevada. What can a person who wants to donate uh, do if they can afford it in their budget. Keep wanting to donate. Keep wanting to donate. In the Amalu bin And you will have the reward of a donor. It's that simple. Keep the desire to donate. Why? Because when 
you have an opportunity to donate, that spirit of giving will still be alive in your heart and you'll give freely. Also pray, what can you do? Ask Allah to give you the wherewithal to donate. Ask Allah Ta'ala to give you the wherewithal to donate. And you'll be amazed at the results. And when you ask, first and foremost, ask of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Faisal asks, how do we understand the hyperbole of this poetry? Do we assume that people actually attain these spirit child you described other than the Prophet are these lines of this is not hyperbole, this is reality. Brothers and sisters, this is reality. You, you, you know, sometimes we are we we forget that we are the products, myself including, we are the products of a materialistic, material civilization. Its primary focus, it's 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 a zeitgeist. Uh, is it it it, it 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 infuses materialism into the depths of our being, its intellectual paradigms, its scientific method. Everything is focused on the material and that which can't be empirically 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 verified doesn't exist. Now think of people; they were from a spiritual civilization. And so being the products of a spiritual civilization, their raw potential was just so much greater than our potential for spiritual realization, for spiritual attainment. So this is, this is very, very real, brothers and sisters. This is not hyperbole. This is not exaggeration. This is not exaggeration. Now Allah give us tawfiq, as I said, to, to attain to a fraction because we're not the products of that civilization. We're further removed from the light of Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. That light still shines in the world, but we're further from it. And so where we are, it's a dimmer, but we can remove the clouds that dim that light. We can remove the haze. So the hearts, they crossed over. And the thing that polishes the heart is the dhikr of Allah, the remembrance of Allah. And so we can remember Allah. We can attach ourselves to the Qur'an. And through that, we can begin to get a glimpse at what, who they were and what they did. As, but why? Because we will have the foundation not necessarily to attain the level they attain, but to understand that it's real. So before you can understand the reality of black holes and string theory and, and what the physicists are talking about, you have to have some familiarization with physics. Otherwise, it's hyperbole, right? But once you begin studying physics, now you understand, oh, a black hole, this is real. String theory, this is real. Uh, braided rings around Saturn, this is real. And, and so we once we begin to enter into this realm of just becoming ilm, just a, 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 a small seeker of some insight into that knowledge, we might not attain what they attain. We not, might, might not uh, memorize a million hadith like Imam Ahmed, but we'll understand that it's, it's possible for a human being to do that because we will have insight into that spiritual realm that allowed that to occur. May Allah give us tawfiq. Another user asks, if there are any books that you recommend that tells us point by point, what Allah wants us to do and what he doesn't want us to do. <clears throat> you get a good thick book. Uh, choose your school. The Shafi school, you could start with uh, the great classic in terms of translation by Sheikh Lou Keller, uh, um, the, the uh, Reliance of the Traveler, translation of Umdat al with uh, fatawa and and uh, 
clarif clarifying notes and rulings from Sheikh Nu Ali Qudah, uh, Sheikh, uh, I'm forgetting Sheikh Nu Sheikh. Anyway, Sheikh, Allahumma Sadr, with uh, several muftis, Sheikh Nu himself, uh, Sheikh Nu Ali Qudah, and Sheikh is slipping my mind in Damascus. I should be ashamed because we we actually went to the masjid where the Sheikh spent time, significant time there. In any case, you get a good fiqh book, and then you get a good book uh, that explains the ethical foundation of the religion, such as Riyadh uh, al-Salihin, the Gardens of the Righteous by Imam Nawawi. There's an excellent three-volume translation and commentary by a group out of South Africa called Muslims at Work. And, uh, and then you get a good translation of Quran. So Halim's translation is very good. And you just go through those three things and you'll have a very, very good idea of what Allah Ta'ala wants you to do. Uh, Hamza, Hamza from Pakistan. Pakistan kam la ilaha illallah. Muhammad Rasulullah. If one wants to recite Quran as well as understanding it through tafsir during Ramadan, how can one divide this limited time? An excellent question. Uh, you you choose how how you divide it. Do you want to focus more on just the barakah from reading, or do you want to focus more on the barakah and understanding? So you choose, uh, or you just, whatever time is available, you could do 50-50, 50% 50, 50, 50 of recitation, 50% of uh, tafsir. And both are, are, we mentioned some of the virtues of reciting, like an alf harf, lam harf, or mim harf. In terms of understanding, man yuridi lahu an mu'awiyata radiyallahu an, qal, qala rasulullahi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, من يريد الله به به خيرا يفكه في الدين وإنما أنا قاسم والله عز وجل يعطي ولن تزال قطائفة من هذه الأمة قائمة بأمر الله لا يضرهم من خالفهم حتى يأتي أمر الله The one Allah desires good for He gives him or her a sound understanding of the religion يفكه في الدين So understanding is very important and so whatever time you have, you have five hours, two and a half hours for recitation, two and a half hours for tafsir. If you have 10 hours, five hours for recitation, five hours for tafsir. If you have two hours, one hour for recitation, one hour for tafsir. If, if you're between those two concerns, some people might devote all of their time to recitation. Uh, Salah Abdul Malik, Ask, what can we do to ward off stinginess? What are some steps we can take to reduce our attachment to material things? Uh, what the ulama recommend is spin little by little. I remember a time, honestly, in my life where <laughs> giving away a dollar was difficult. And it might have been like, I mean, we were, we, we were poor. So we, we came, when you got a dollar, you were like, man, I'm holding on to this joker. Uh, but over time, you just spend a quarter. Keep your 75 cents, spend your quarter until you become acclimated slowly, slowly to just letting it go. And so you start small. You start small, as in, in all things. You start with baby steps. So get in the habit of just spending that dollar. So not writing a $1,000 check at the next fundraiser, but every opportunity you get, spend a dollar, give a dollar, put a dollar in the box in the masjid. You know, go to the bank and get a stack of $1 bills. And every time you go in the masjid, put a dollar in the box. And so you acclimate yourself to spending, acclimate yourself to spending, and then graduate to $2. And then every Friday, start giving $10 till you graduate to $20, if you have it. And slowly, it will become easy to let the world go. And this is this not only conditions us 
to uh, spend more, it conditions us to be prepared to die. So a lot of people aren't prepared to die. And so uh, the ulama, they say, uh, I specifically can recall this uh, from, I, I'm, I'm confident that this is something I read from Ibn Qayyim and Jawziya, that usually in the Quran, not all the, all, all the time, in Surah Tawbah, there's an exception, a couple others, but usually in the Quran, spending with the wealth is mentioned before spending with the, with the life. For example, Surah Saf, uh, yeah, yeah, so and struggle jahidu so he says the struggle with the wealth where we condition ourselves to let go of the world because our wealth is what we own and possess of the world little by little prepares us to let go of the entire world, is what, which is what happens when we go forth and struggle with our lives. And so, and that, that doesn't mean necessarily situations that rarely come. So in our life, the opportunity to formally go out and physically defend the faith, that might not come. But there might be an opportunity to save a life. Recently, we had this tragedy in Oakland, California, very complicated situation. But the bottom line, some thugs set the Muslim house on fire and the husband ran out and was saved. And then he realized that his wife and the baby were still inside. He got the wife out and then when he went back to get the baby, the house collapsed, the husband and baby were killed. So he was prepared to let it go. And so spending, let the whole world go. I might, I might have nothing left in this world after I go back into this house, but he rushed back in. And so letting go of it bit by bit conditions us to let all of it go when we're in a situation to let it all go. He was confronted with a situation to let it all go. And so letting it go little by little conditions us for that. Okay, Allah Masar Rasulullah. And uh, this has to be the last question because you guys have to, on the West Coast, they have to break their fast, get ready for Taraweeh. As what is the difference between Western logic and Mantaq? <laughs> Arab, uh, uh, Arabic and English. Because there, there, there are, uh, okay, I, I, I see, if you refer to Islamic logic, uh, Islamic logic has been divested, divested of any propositions or premises that would lead to conclusions that would negate the power of Allah and do and reduce everything to, to pure reason. So I, I, that's the best I can do right now, this time of night. So. May Allah bless us to, uh, and, and the Muslim logistic logicians were cognizant of that, of, of divesting this science, it's extremely beneficial science, of anything that would lead to uh, conclusions that were ran counter to the theological foundations of the religion. Whereas in, in Western thought, that, that's not a consideration. So you get into this uh, a realm of, of pure reason. That's been cr critiqued by Western philosophers such as Kant and others. So may Allah give you all tawfiq and taysir and kabul. And tomorrow night, we look forward to continuing the journey, inshallah. We pray that this is beneficial for you. And uh, we pray that Allah Ta'ala blesses us all to, to maintain good health, to protect us. Uh, from the virus and other dangers. It's not like the only danger out there is coronavirus or COVID-19, but there are a lot of dangers, and may Allah protect us from all of them. May Allah Ta'ala bless you. 
bless your families, may Allah Ta'ala bless Zaytuna College and all of the other wonderful projects that the Muslims are engaged in. May Allah Subh'anaHu Wa Ta'ala bless your families and may Allah keep us all alive and healthy until again we meet. Wa sallallahu ala sayyidina Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam wa alaykum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.